as you grab your seats, it's truly an honor, a privilege, and a pleasure to introduce Dr. Freischleit. She received her bachelor's uh, from the University of Illinois Medical School from Rush, and then surgery residency and master of surgery fellowship at UCLA. She then went on to faculty positions essentially across the country before landing at Johns Hopkins University as chairman uh, and uh, chief of staff at the hospital. And we are extremely fortunate to now call her our dean. She's dean of the School of Medicine, vice chancellor for uh, health services for UC Davis. Innumerable um, honors throughout. I just want to highlight three. Uh, she is currently the chair of the Board of the Regents, the American <coughs> College of Surgeons, our professional organization. She's president of the Society of Vascular Surgeons. And one fashion that I've gotten to know her, know her over the last decade is she is editor-in-chief of JAMA Surgery. Innumerable publications covering a variety of things, but really, uh, truly an honor for me to have known her, to present her, and she'll lecture to us on clinical and personal security effectiveness. Thank you so much. Dr. Christ. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Um, so I knew Dr. Bold, he was on the editorial board. That's my 10th year being editor of JAMA Surgery, and he was on the editorial board when I first got there. And, and I gave grand rounds about, I don't know, six years ago, something like six or seven years ago when I came out here and, and really didn't have an idea when I went to Hopkins I would come back to UC. So it did take me six months to get my license, so it's, I got it for the third time. Uh, but I do uh, really appreciate um, being part of the group. Um, my, my role is sort of very interesting. This is my fifth month, so I spend time in many different arenas. This is very comfortable here. Um, and I do uh, want to participate in surgery in whatever way I can, whether it's through the college, if you're interested in being on committees, or want to get involved with young surgeons or the residents. There's lots of opportunity. There's grants for residents through the American College of Surgeons. Uh, the meeting this year is in San Francisco. So just email me and let me know. Similar for the Society of Vascular Surgery, if you want to be on a committee, John got on his committee uh, that he wanted on the past president but still can influence uh, a little bit who's on committees for that as well. And I am going to stop being editor uh, in December. It'll be 10 years I'm editor of JAMA Surgery, so there'll probably be some opportunities to be on that editorial board. So if you have any interest with that, let me know as well. So today I'm going to talk a little bit um, about clinical and personal comparative effectiveness. Uh, you probably wonder what is she going to talk about, so that's probably why you showed up. And I'm going to talk a little bit about comparative effectiveness research, which we all need to do more of. We're actually very good at it as surgeons. We've always done that. We've always looked at our outcomes. We listened today about how can we do better. I like how you say room for improvement versus big mistake where I came from, that's what we called it, but it was great the way you frame um, your m and I think that's fabulous. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about personal comparative effectiveness. With the college, we've done a lot of work on burnout and uh, wellness, and it's published in the surgical literature, and really wasn't my idea, but I helped do those studies, and especially as we start off a new year with new residents and new faculty, I think it's important. So comparative effectiveness is a buzzword, especially young surgeons. You're going to have to figure out what happens to your patients not only in the first 30 days and then it's not my fault. You're going to have to follow them for years and show that what you did in your intervention was helpful. And as a vascular surgeon, you know, that's very important because we used to do just a little better for a little longer. And now we really have to look at more long-term outcomes. So there's really no great definition, but the Institute of Medicine has this one. And this is what we do, right? We generate and synthesize evidence. Is it better? Compares benefits of harm. Should we have operated on a person? Should we have not? Should we angioplasty? Should we bypass? You know, should we have made a bigger incision on that foot or smaller? And it's other ways that we prevent, diagnose, and treat or monitor a clinical condition. And in vascular surgery, we monitor a lot of our patients. And, and don't operate on them. So we've been doing this for years, and we really are, are one group that actually looks at outcomes more than others. So the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act of 2010 is really important, and this is another place you can get research funding, and it's not that difficult. Uh, it, you can almost write a white paper on something interesting. Two of my faculty, right before I left 
Hopkins got two PCORI grants. One was on looking should you anticoagulate cancer patients in the month after they go home from a major operation. We don't know that answer. We think the answer is yes. No one will pay for the anticoagulation. Should we look at that? And Elliot Howe got that grant. And then uh, Adil Hader looked at how can we better assess gender preference as patients come in on the trauma service. He got money for that and actually Ed Callahan from here is working on it with that. So sort of simple thoughts about what you want to do and you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I would recommend doing that and one person serving on PCORI is a surgeon, Bob Solak, who's a vascular surgeon. And these are great because it's actually not trying to figure out how not to pay for things, which really was uh, the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, but it's really looking at how we can better take care of our patients. So one thing, to, and you can turn those in all year long. There's no deadline with that. So think about that for those of you looking at big questions, sort of simple big questions for your patients. So the two things, um, you won't remember much of what I say today, so we're going to think of three things that you'll remember. So for the students and residents, what is the difference between effectiveness and efficacy? And, and that's important, because as you go to clinic today, you're going to be using both trying to help take care of your patients. So the real world is effectiveness. It's like whatever you know. It's the retrospective studies, it's your experience, it's everything you put together, and you look at that patient and say, if I were, was you, this is what we would do. And it's really real world, and, and probably 70 to 80 percent of what we do is more effectiveness. But efficacy is clinical trials, and that's where I've spent the last 10 years of my life working with the VA, and I did get transferred to the VA on Sunday, so I am a VA surgeon. Again, I think I saw Scott here to do it. So I'm a two-eighths VA person, um, got transferred. Um, did my fourth set of fingerprints. I am still the same person since I got to California. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting for my fifth when I go to David Grant. Maybe I'll have to do six of them. Um, but efficacy is really gold, the gold standard. We took something, we split people in two, we decided what is better. And I'm going to give you some examples of both of these today. So I'm going to use aortic aneurysms as my teaching tool today. Um, all of us in vascular really are very interested. These are famous people, all that have had aneurysms, or either ruptured aneurysms. Lucille Ball actually was at Cedars-Sinai and had an aortic dissection repaired and ruptured or infrarenal aneurysm while she was in hospital, which um, was an interesting thing. They didn't know she had it, which was interesting. Uh, but when you look at aneurysms, they're really a, a leading cause of death. And the tenth leading cause in people over 55, which sitting here at 59, has become much more interesting to me. So what is an aneurysm? For the students, it's a permanent dilatation of an artery. Your aorta is about the size of your thumb, so any enlargement uh, of your aorta is an aneurysm. It's more than one and a half times. We see more in men than women, and a third or more will have associated other aneurysms. So what are your risk factors for this? And uh, those that have aneurysms, um, they're either a cigarette smoker or they're a liar. Okay, all of them smoke okay? uh, and have had a history of smoking. About 40% will have hypertension to do that because the, of the increased pressure. And the second thing I want you to remember today is genetic predisposition. So if you meet someone that has an aneurysm, about a third of them will have a first order uh, relative mm -hmm. with an aneurysm. Now, the story I'm going to tell you, which you know I tell lots of stories, is I was in clinic at Hopkins and I get a call from my dad. Um, I was born in Decatur, <coughs> Illinois. They retired there and they were at the hospital where I was born, St. Mary's. Decatur's about three hours south of Chicago. There's about 70,000 people there. It's known for soybeans and high flyer kites for those of us that are older that remember those. Um, and my mom had had some chronic back pain, osteoporosis, had been in ICU for a Vioxx overdose, and she's in a scanner in order trying to figure out how bad her back is. And I, uh, my dad calls and says, they say she has a ruptured aneurysm. My mother, okay? So I, I had examined my dad, because both my parents were smokers, and he claudicated a bit, uh, but I never had examined my mother. And so it was a 6.7 centimeter aneurysm. They said it was a contained rupture. In that hospital, they do at least one or two aneurysms a year in that hospital. It's a very nice hospital to be born in, but not a very good hospital to have an aneurysm repair in. Um, my dad went to a vascular surgeon there that follows claudication. That's about what he was good at. Uh, so I told him to get the IV out of her hand. This is a true story because the back pain wasn't much different. I said, get in the car and drive really fast to Chicago because my brother lives there. 
things go well, you can get on Southwest Airlines Baltimore in the morning, right, to do it. Um, otherwise, there's a couple hospitals in Chicago that do a few more aneurysms per year, and we'll talk about that a bit today. So it turned out she did have a six-point centimeter, not contained rupture, but an aneurysm. And where did that come from? Okay, so my grandfather was a coal miner, and he dropped dead when he was uh, 72, and I was six years old. And when we think back, he probably ruptured an aneurysm. And her brother dropped dead at 59. He probably ruptured an aneurysm. So my family, especially if you have a woman in your family that has an aneurysm, has a genetic uh, predisposition to aneurysms. So my aorta is 1.7, just so you don't have to worry, Bill. <laughs> um, but uh, it is very powerful. And she ended up having an open repair by Bruce Perler because she had a short, fat, wide calcific neck that got into her iliac vein. She was there took two weeks. It was a mess, but she made it through. Uh, and uh, uh, so this is how you're going to remember genetic predisposition because of my mother. And also, infrarenal aneurysms form where the renals and the iliacs pin down that aorta. It bounces on the spine. And if you want to create an aneurysm, that's the best way to do it, just like a co-art to make that happen. So what's the risk of rupture? Um, Bernstein, Dr. Bernstein is one of my heroes. I think one of the best things about surgeons is there's so many hero stories. There's many here. I, I'm having lunch with Dr. Blaisdell on Friday in San Francisco uh, after our JAMA surgery meeting. And, and Dr. Bernstein was one of my heroes. When my first job in San Diego, he was there. And we lost him early. He ended up um, dying of a, a pulmonary embolism and diagnosed with a glioblastoma. But he was one of the first ones to really look at ultrasound. He's really the father of ultrasound to, to do that. And, and if you look at the annual risk of rupture, you can see sort of where my mother sat. So we know that we need to intervene to prevent rupture. So let's do a couple examples of effectiveness with aneurysms, a couple examples of uh, efficacy so you can see that. So this paper we published in the Journal of Vascular Surgery looking at hospital teaching status. So this is why I was very nervous about my mother being at St. Mary's in Decatur, Illinois, because it wasn't a teaching hospital. And Rob McGee, our first author, is a faculty member now. He's a thoracic surgeon at Denver. And Ben Brook was one of our residents who did his fellowship in vascular at Dartmouth and now is at Utah on staff. Bruce Perler, who when I left became vice chair of operations in our department and myself. And we wanted to see, does it make a difference if they land here uh, in a teaching hospital versus if you land in something, some hospital like St. Mary's. So we used the national inpatient sample file and we're able to look about all the patients, about all the hospitals. We're able to see if they were ruptured because that's what we were looking at. And then how were they treated either with open or this was the first time we started seeing endovascular repair. Did they die or live? And over 11,000 patients we could assess what was interesting to sort of go along with the palliative care piece that you were just talking about, almost 40% didn't undergo repair. And, and you don't know whether that's patient choice or doctor choice or where they, that's a big number because I've had one patient, I don't know how many bills had that says don't fix me, uh, but most people want you to. And it's, it's, a, it's a tough thing to fix them then. But it's interesting because if you do, I see more older patients, especially in their 80s and 90s, who really don't want you to do anything that severe. So you want, I wonder about that number. So over 6,000 had an open repair, a few hundred had endo, and it usually is a male disease, unlike my mother, which you're going to remember genetic predisposition because of my mom, but they're 78% males, 74. So there was a 42% perioperative mortality, and it was lower at teaching hospitals, about 39%, which when you look at the literature, it's anywhere between 50 and 80%. And vascular surgery training hospital, as you can see, they are down to 34%. So a marked decrease to that. So that's excellent. Um, and a 25% decrease in vascular surgery training hospital. So what does that mean? It means you've got all of you young people running around the hospital that can help us get the patient started. You can make the diagnosis. You've got the OR. You've got nurses. You've got equipment. You've got all that stuff that makes it so you can make that happen. And if you looked at the endo, this was what the first time we've ever impacted on the death rate after rupture, is that the patient comes in stable and is able to have an endovascular repair at a vascular surgery teaching hospital, 19% mortality. And the first time we've seen an impact on that. So not only the technique, diagnosis, but actually impacts on mortality. So the critical factors is the teaching hospital. That's why my mother was driven up to Chicago. And then also looking at the specialty within that institution about what they do. 
Now, what about those patients that we decide too sick to operate on or they don't want to have operating? And I've done a lot of work in the VA. Uh, the VA, if you were to look at my CV, is really my career. I started working in the VA. I'm a 33-year uh, VA employee, very good VA employee. Um, and Frank Letterly and I have done a body of work. Uh, he's an internist at Minnesota. Uh, who has an interest in geriatrics, and many of these names you'll recognize of people. And this was one we published in JAMA uh, in 2002. We wanted to see, what do you do with those large aneurysms you decide not to touch, like my mom? So we looked at 200 veterans. The aneurysm had to be at least five and a half. And either we said, you're too sick, this is before endo, or they said, I don't want any surgery. And we watched them for a year and a half. And what was great in the VA is outcomes are easy to find. They come back. And we actually had autopsies done on about half of them. And about 45 probably did rupture. And what did we find? It actually was more significant rupture rate than Eugene Bernstein had reported years before. And if you look at where my mom sat right here, her risk of rupture was almost 20% that first year. And if it was eight centimeters, the risk of rupture is about 25%. So if you do decide not to operate on someone, which may be that 40% in the inpatient sample, they're gonna rupture. So you have to put that out there so the patient, the family understands, which may be okay, that, it, that if you don't do something, you may <coughs> rupture. So it's, once you hit five and a half, it's substantially um, increased rupture rate and keeps going up because of the law of Laplace if it's higher. So the last one I'll do on effectiveness is a study that Ruby Sue Mayberry did. So Ruby Sue is a, a chief resident now at, at Georgetown. She came and did her MPH at Hopkins. And David Chang is a PhD that worked with us, went to San Diego now, actually is at Mass General. And our question was looking at rural hospitals. If you have a rural hospital, which we have a few here, and almost every city I've been in, even Maryland had Hagerstown, and LA had Bakersfield, so everyone has a rural hospital, and you get those calls, I want to transfer this patient. When I moved to Wisconsin, I, I failed to ask about our hospital. It was the only level one trauma center in the state. I didn't know that. Wisconsin's quite a large state. Uh, and every ruptured aneurysm got transferred to us. So the first one they wanted to transfer, I said no, because in LA we said don't transfer, because it was my fault if something happens. Not so much in Wisconsin, they all came. So one of the first papers I wrote was about the transfers in. So we wonder, what will happen? Do they do better if you transfer? I guess my mom was sort of a transfer. She wasn't rough, rough, ruptured. Or is it better for them to stay? Now, Ruby Sue was so impressed with her surgery, she's going to be an endocrine surgeon. That was what she decided to do. Um, but she did great, uh, got her master's. So what she did is she used that same data set and looked at those that ruptured and saw whether they were transferred and did they live or die. And they were able to pull out about 148, as you can see, that got transferred, and over 6,000 again that ruptured. And what did we find? So if you look at rural versus urban populations, they're a little bit older in the rural area, a little bit more female in urban, and primarily white patients, but a little bit more diverse in urban. And what was interesting is uninsured is more uh, significant in the rural population than the urban. And teaching hospitals, about a third of the rurals thought, considered themselves teaching, over 55% urban. And then we looked at how many reluctives do they do. With, of course, we thought that would affect, since we know about teaching hospitals and experience, and you can see that much fewer rural hospitals did more than 15 electives a year, 41 versus 82. There are about the same percentage GPs in the population, but more vascular surgeons per capita in the rural, which is interesting because it had an influence, we think, on how the patients did. So if you are at a rural location and you have a ruptured presentation, uh, you're more likely to be ruptured at a rural. You're more likely to be transferred if you're at a rural uh, place, but you're not more likely to die. So if they do decide to keep you there, you actually do pretty well. Teaching hospitals, less likely to rupture, less likely to transfer, but similar death rate. And there's no question if they did fewer aneurysms, you were more likely to be transferred and more likely to die. GPs had no influence on what happened to these patients, but vascular surgeons, if they're present, showed less rupture presentation, less transfer, and less death. 
So rural hospitals do see more ruptures, similar to my mother, but she was not ruptured, but she came in thinking they thought she was. They're more likely to transfer, but they do just as well there or in transfer. So now I want to give you a couple examples of efficacy, and, and this is probably two of my best things I've published, and one was just two years ago. So for young faculty, don't give up. You know, you're going to end up uh, doing some great things as you go through your career. So this is the third thing. So we've already learned about genetic predisposition to aneurysms, what's efficacy and effectiveness. And this is where 5.5 comes from. We actually prove the size. So here's Frank again, um, Frank Letterly, Eric Wilson, who many of you know from California. And I was one of the site PIs for the ADAM trial. And this is where we wanted to determine if you fix that aneurysm when it was smaller, would the patients do better? Simple question uh, to do that. And, and what we did is we randomized these patients. So 569 who had aneurysms between 4 and 5.4 had immediate surgery. This was all open because um, there was no endo then. And then 567, we just watched. And we watched them grow. And once they hit 5.5, then we intervened. So about two-thirds that we watched did grow. And overall, this was a very powerful study because about 92% got what they were supposed to get for their intervention. Now, the one thing about clinical trials is, is these patients are heroes, aren't they? Just like our heroes in surgery. They come in and you say, okay, you got a 4.9 centimeter aneurysm. We're either going to operate on it or we're going to watch it. And we're going to call somebody and they're going to tell us what to do. And, and I don't know what is the better answer for you. Are you in? And they go, yeah. Now, with my mother, I was shopping her scan all over the country. Everybody got it. And finally, um, Roy Greenberg, who we've recently lost, one of uh, a young surgeon that died of cancer, he said, Julie, no one really wants to operate on your mother, you know. But, but I shopped her <laughs> everywhere to do it. Um, poor Bruce, he had to operate on my mother. Um, but these patients just go on in. You know, talk about a hero. Now, granted, we think both ways are good, and we're going to watch them when we take care of them. But these veterans that participate in these trials are really heroes. And so what we found is that death was not, uh, that was our number one thing. And we got a little confused for a decade about aneurysms. We were treating them so they didn't grow. We really treat aneurysms so they don't rupture. That's the big Thing. And so there was no reduction in data breath at when we looked at the immediate versus the waiting. So if patients do come back and get imaged, that there really isn't a difference if you do it early. And there was a very low mortality rate when you decide to do aneurysm repair, it should be under 3%. Now, a few of the surveilled did rupture, uh, and a lot of them that got operated on come back, and the residents know that that failure to thrive, big operation, they'll be back, you know, about 10 days later. Uh, but overall, it was not improved. So this is the number, you know. So if you decide to intervene with a lower number, you've got to have a reason. You know, either it's symptomatic, maybe it's odd-shaped. Some people think women, if it has, it should be repaired. But 5.5 is that number, and we're sticking to it. And, and I think part of it is we've looked at endovascular repair. Some sites have decided to repair smaller ones because endo is so simple to do. But as we'll talk about next, endo is very expensive. Uh, an endovascular graft is about $35,000. That's just the stuff. And if we're going to treat everyone with that, where are the other dollars going to be to take care of people that rupture? So, Whatever you do and whatever you treat, we need to be very mindful of expense now. And that's going to just be the part of the way we deal business. So the last one I'm going to tell you, and this is the, probably the best thing I've done, and I did this just as I was moving here, sort of. We published in New England. Here's Frank again, my good friend Frank, who I've known for years. Um, and I was the national PI. So if you do a good job as a site PI uh, and also have no affiliation with any of the, the device companies, that was the other thing, is I, I don't deal with um, device companies, uh, so they figured I'd be fair, um, that we actually ran this. Tassos is uh, the statistician that works in West Haven that works with this. And we went to look at what's what is different between endo and open, head to head. So again, patients come in and we say, uh, you have an aneurysm that needs to be fixed. Uh, you have anatomy by CT scan that you can have an endo. Uh, you have physiology that you could be put to sleep and have op open. We're going to pull a card, and either going to have a great big operation or you're going to have an endovascular repair. Are you in? And they go, sure. So again, another group 
of heroes. Because at the time we started this back in 2002, it really was unclear. Uh, there were, the graphs weren't that good. We probably were just learning. There'd been some studies in Europe. So we weren't quite sure which was better. And we really thought, if you were thinking, who do you think would benefit most from this? It would be the older patient, right? We thought, well, the older patient is the one that should have endo and the younger open. And as I'm going to show you, we found out exactly the opposite. So we looked at patients uh, greater than five, and we used any FDA-approved device, because a couple of them came on market, a couple came off. And that's the newest way, too, with trials now, as many of these devices will come on and off the market. So we wanted to see long-term morbidity and mortality. So 881 heroes were randomized, and we followed them for nine years. So we not only have endo, but we have open data on how these patients do. And the biggest thing is they are living longer. Aneurysm room patients used to only live about five years. My mother actually only lived a year and a half. She ended up having amyloid vasculitis and had a massive stroke at a year and a half. And when we look back at that, you know, my father for sure thought it was well worth it. So did I. And I have two brothers. I have one who's a special ed high school teacher, and he thought it was okay. But I have an older brother who's a venture capitalist. And he said, I thought you fixed her. You know, he wanted to look at return on investment and what happened. Uh, he also was never around to help take care of her. But, uh, but he definitely had it. Your families will have definite different thoughts about how intervention went. And so she lived a year and a half from her open repair, which frankly has changed my thinking a lot. Because after she went through all that, you know, a year and a half to me wasn't quite long enough. And could we have predicted that? So in this trial, 90% male, 80% white, average age 70, really huge average weight, 90 kilograms, 41% uh, smokers, you know, 59% liars, and then coronary artery disease and size. And as you can see, we um, used all different, got, this is for vascular, you can see we really looked at all different graphs. So 95% uh, got the repair. And there was equal death in both groups. So as we looked at this, it was interesting. At two years, we published this in JAMA that um, actually showed there was better outcomes with endo. At three years, still better outcomes with endo. But at four years, the lines crossed, probably because of their chronic diseases and other issues. So at four years, it didn't seem to be a difference. There were uh, some aneurysm-related deaths, 10 in the endovascular group and 16 in the open group. Most of the open were perioperative. And we did have six ruptures in the endo group, which is uh, something we're very concerned about. Um, and as I mentioned, the survival was better in younger patients with endo. So if you do have great anatomy, younger patients do better. And the survival was better in older patients that if they have great physiology, they actually do better with the open group. Of the ones that ruptured, this is mainly for the vascular surgeons. The scary thing is after five years after the repair, so that makes us nervous. Three were fatal. Some of them, because they didn't have the initial repair, they still had to be in the attempt to treat. Some didn't come in for imaging. Some migrated and all that. The key is you really need to intervene if the sac is enlarging. And we did show that there were 148 endo, uh, therapeutic procedures in 98 patients in the endo group. So you did see some reintervention, But we also saw it in the open group. We were the first ones to show they actually had um, uh, hernias that needed to be fixed. And when you think back to when I first trained, we did think there was some relationship between hernias and aneurysms because of elastase and collagenase. And the way I'm going to tell you to remember that years ago when I was a chief resident at the VA, I was helping an intern do a hernia. And I had my elbow on the patient's abdomen. And we're fixing the hernia. And my elbow starts going like this. And I go, did you examine this patient? Oh, sure, he's got a hernia. And I said, I think he may have something else, nine centimeter aneurysm. OK, so we fixed the hernia. And then later that week, we fixed the aneurysm. So we did a little different uh, approach to that. But people with hernias um, actually can have some elastase, maybe cigarette smoke. We're not quite sure what connects it. But if you do do an open aneurysm, make sure you sew it tight, because 48 had to have repairs, and there were 11 bowel obstructions. So endo and open, similar long-term results. And it does look like you do get some benefit of survival of endo at the beginning. Very expensive procedures, so you want to make sure they live a long time, unlike my mother, only a year and a half. But rupture after endo is a concern, so we're still looking for that perfect graft. And endovascular repair uh, led to better long-term survival in our younger patients.
Now, we just presented our endoleak paper at the vascular meeting last month, and we looked at the endoleak. So this is where the graft is in, but then blood ends up going back into the aneurysm sac. And we did see 187 at 6.2 years. And of the four EVARs that we saw that ruptured, two had endoleaks. So it doesn't appear as long as the sac isn't growing, you need to intervene. And uh, Wei Zhao presented this, and uh, Brashis Law did the work on it. As you can see, most of our endoleaks were type 2. You can see when, how many there were at month and greater than two years. And there's no question when you look at this that if they come late, so initially you don't have an endoleak, and then it comes late, that that actually makes you have higher risk. So presence of endoleak had increased aneurysm diameter over time, over half resolved, so you can watch them. 31% had secondary intervention, and if you had a big aneurysm, uh, you probably will need to have an intervention. So delay type twos were actually much more significant uh, and didn't seem to be related to size. So for the last uh, few minutes, I want to talk about personal comparative effectiveness. And I think one thing um, we would really like all of you to do in your career as a surgeon is to love being a surgeon and love your personal career. And I would like many of you to end up being an academic surgeon. And part of that is our job to show you how much fun we're having and how great it is. Because frankly, one of the reasons you don't want to be us is perhaps we might complain a little bit. Maybe we don't like it. What we do last time, I think we signed up for this. I don't think anybody made us do this. Um, but I think if I were to spend time with you, which I hope to do, is to tell you with my career being a vascular surgeon, a chair of surgery, and now a dean, is that there's so many things you can contribute in academia. And I couldn't imagine not doing what I do. And you're career is going to be really, really long, okay? So you, we get to be in this field forever, and we can contribute many different ways. And the key, I think, is being flexible and learning new things and staying with that. And that's sort of why we hang with all you young people, because you make us feel young, and you, you have to listen to you. And our kids don't listen to us anymore, okay? We all have kids. They don't listen to us. But you will, because you think you hang on every word. So part of it is we love being with you because you make us feel good. So um, we did all these studies with Mayo Clinic. And if you look up burnout in my name, you'll get a whole list of them looking at specialty and that. And I'm just going to show you a couple of them. The one I... I want to talk about today is gender, because gender is really changing in surgery. I never thought it would in my career. And, and I do research with Lizzie here. And I've never met Lizzie Ott. Um, we just talk by phone and text. We don't even do FaceTime. But Lizzie is a, an internist that has looked at all specialties. And she tells me we're really unusual, that we have very different thoughts, mainly because our field is so urgent emergent that many fields are elected, clinics, this and that. We're urgent emergent. So there's many times we can't negotiate out what you need to do tomorrow. And, and Charles Balch had me, helped me do this. He's a surgical oncologist that now is down at Southwestern. And they had noticed that women surgeons that were surgeon oncologists had a higher rate of depression. So this is going to feel a little sad for a little bit, but at the end it's going to be really happy. Okay, So, <laughs> so you, you don't want to get sad, and at the end it's going to be really, really happy. So we wanted to see burnout and career satisfaction. There's tools for this. You can figure out if you're burned out or not. I actually gave this to my department at Hopkins, and we actually came out a little better than the national average. That was great. Um, but actually, we can look at mental disorders and burnout. And if you're interested, I can get you a survey if you want to know. Uh, about 32% responded through the American College of Surgeons. We just did another one, which I appreciate anybody else that, applied, that replied. We're looking sort of at alcoholism and drug abuse as well to see what in fact and we did have over a thousand women answer, which is um, significant. So the last thing I want you to remember is this: women surgeons differed on every demographic variable measured. So I think this will actually change in the next ten years, because as you can see, women surgeons by and large are ten years younger, and that's a big deal. And if you look at how many are married, this is markedly increased since once I started, where about 15% of women were married, uh, more men were a little less divorced um, than men. And if you ask women does your partner or spouse work outside the home? Big difference here, 80% versus men surgeons. And that's changing, too, because young men surgeons, their partners tend to work outside the home as well, too. Now, women surgeons were partnered with surgeons, other surgeons, almost a third of the time. 
And that's a real problem, because <laughs> they're really busy. And, and I had four sets of couples in my department before I came here. And I know there's many here, but also men's surgeons, about 5%. And men's surgeons, about a fourth with other physicians. So we don't get out much, OK? So the people we meet and hang with are all in the hospital. And that I don't see that changing. Uh, and therefore, when you look at non-medical professionals, women still. Uh, but we, we, this is one of the big issues, is that we're both your partners and you are really busy. And you have any children, women, about 60%. This has doubled over the last 20 years, men, 91%. And when did you have them? Women, a little bit more during residency, but mainly your new young partner. Uh, they're having kids, about a third of men. And the age of your youngest child, as you can see, uh, women much more younger. And, and these, I have a bunch of these. I have 34, 33, and 19. And, and they need attention, but it's usually a check. You know, it's not a lot of attention. Uh, where this is a lot of time and attention in softball games, right? So, so it's a, just a different way to take care of them. Uh, and this is just you can find where you are sitting here. There were more percentage-wise about the same general surgeons, even though the numbers were there, surgical oncologists a little bit, not too many vascular surgeons. So years in practice, again, this will all change in 10 years because women, by and large, it's about nine years, hours work per week, about the same. These are mainly private practitioners that answer this survey, about two and a half calls a week. Did the commitment to children slow your career? Men, not so much. Um, women, yeah, about 60%. And who cares for the kid when the kid is sick or has a non-school day? So those of you without kids, that's what that is, non-school day. Um, and in men, the spouse did over 70% of the time. Women's more nannies. And did you have a recent conflict with your partner or spouse's career? And as you can see, women more than men. And it really had to do with their career, that women tend to take on that conflict and as you'll see, especially if you're a non-surgeon, the women are taking that conflict because of the urgent, emergent nature of being partnered with a surgeon. And so this is the sad part, but it'll get very happy later. So uh, women were a little bit more burnt out and depressed, as you can see, than men. And this is mainly because of these work-home conflicts, because Lizzie says the other groups don't have that, that you're able to negotiate being a lawyer or an internist or a dermatologist, and that it's they're similar to men and women, but that women really are taking partners with that. So we were really <coughs> interested in this dual physician because for those of us that recruit residents and faculty, that's the, that's the norm now. They're all partnered, so you have to figure that out. And so we looked at those who has a physician partner. And they tend to be younger, so they're all the young people. They're newer to practice, delay children. They feel that their career's not going where it needs to go, and they don't have enough time. Okay, so if that sounds like you, then you're just like everyone else. And so now we have to figure out how are we going to make this work. So you get more of these conflicts where you're sort of running into each other. Uh, I actually felt that the last four months as I moved here. I was president of the Vasker Society, chair of the Board of Regents, moved here, had to figure out how to be a dean, nothing but net, OK? And, and oh, by the way, my son got married over Memorial Day. And my other son's wife is pregnant due in August. And my other son finished his first year in college. They were, didn't notice I was busy, you know? So the, the world goes on out there. And so you just move as fast as you can. So when you look at dual physician relationships, here's people's domestic partners. These are female surgeons, male surgeons. As you can see, when you look at the percentage, um, the total number men more. But when you look at the total according to who they're partnered with, men are more often with stay at home, more often with working non-MDs. And so I, I've been married to all of these, OK? I've been married to a physician. My first husband was a medical oncologist. I'm a little unclear why I did that. Um, <laughs> then <laughs> Phil, who you meet, is who's my best partner. Um, Phil was the CFO when I first met him. And so now he's a little older than me and retired when I became chair of surgery. So now he's here. This is really good, OK? This is everything gets done. Everything's fine. Um, it's amazing. But sometimes you can't choose that. So physicians partnered uh, to other physicians were more likely to depress. Now, don't get sad, OK, and have low mental quality life, mainly because you don't have that stay-at-home person uh, taking care of all the issues. And when you asked, did raising children slow your career, surgeons, surgeons, we sort of nuke it out. If you're partnered with another surgeon, you split everything. But if you're partnered with another physician, that other physician does a lot. And so we need to think about that other partner who perhaps isn't a surgeon. And when you cared for your child when ill, you know, surgeons, surgeons, again, 
they are pretty equal if it's a physician more than physician more nannies and we were worried about this child home alone look at all that I hope the kids were at least 12 or something to do we don't know um, so whose career is priority as a, a, mon a mentor and a, a sponsor I hear this all the time you know how are we going to make this work and and again with surgeons you, we sort of nuke it out you know surgeon surgeons equal you figure it out but surgeon physician which is the males that we have right now that physician sometimes gives up a career or takes and we have had that issue here and there's a big program here at UC Davis called POP which is looking at partners and we really Fred Meyer spends a lot of time getting the partners here as well so surgeons whose partners the other physician has trouble balancing it and, and it, it's much more difficult than if they're a non-working uh, non-physician or someone at home and so what do we do as leaders and all of you are leaders you're either leaders of your team rounding you're uh, with your medical students you're either leaders in your lab you're leaders in your division you're all leaders so you need to talk about it that's the number one thing I bring it up today you need to know if you have a sick kid or something you need to talk about it one of my favorite stories at the Maryland VA I'm doing a distal bypass um, with Caroline and in the middle of the case in comes Manny and relieves her <laughs> and I go excuse me uh, anything going on well my kid is sick and my husband has an interview and I've got to go and I said well that's great but you could have told me you know here I'm the consistent person here to do it but conversations are helpful and it was right we did just fine they were two chief residents but you need to tell me what's going on so conversations are crucial communication about people that are sick things you need to do other things and, and making sure you have enough help make sure you have daycare nannies whatever it takes family uh, whatever it takes so that you don't feel pressured to either leave your patient or leave your family in a place that's not a good place we need to have daycare I'm working on that okay that's on my my plate to get a daycare here because we don't have one uh, and then we do look at promotion we really have adjusted promotion so that you can have this really really long career and women live longer than men maybe women will be chairs when they're in their 60s so we can get the recruitment we can get that uh, done and then you need to include the spouse and everything in the recruitment about and I think Sacramento is a great place to have a dual partnership career because it's easy to get around here everything's close uh, I think it's uh, less expensive than San Francisco and LA where it's intense I have kids in both cities there um, so I think that we have much on our plate that's positive here to make this work but the key is communication and as you lead your team you know even your medical students ask them are they okay what's going on you can tell if someone's frazzled and you certainly don't want to do a big operation if someone's not taking care of your kid or you wonder where they are and at daycare you know they they start charging you lots and I don't know what you they do with the kid if you don't show up they they may may sell them I don't know so so you need to show up you know to do it and I did have daycare when Taylor was little on camp. so you need to have all that covered and we need to help you do it Okay, so uh, in conclusion, um, there's no standard definition for comparative effectiveness. So we talked about effectiveness and efficacy, so we know that difference. Um, and you need to do this about personal and medical. And, and if you want to learn about burnout, just put my name in burnout and Google it, and all of that will come out. There's always going to be challenges and limitations, but I gave a talk to the chairs a couple weeks ago. That's what's great about it. Every day we come to work and we get to do something different. Sometimes we get to do way too much different and way too much stuff, but we get to do that. And that these big population studies may not apply to that patient sitting right in front of you. And certainly don't compare yourself to another resident or another faculty member. I never understood why people watch the OR schedule and wonder why so-and-so is doing a pancreas and so-and-so is doing an aneurysm. Why am I not doing that? I, I never looked at the OR schedule. I could care less what anybody else was doing. I just cared what I was doing today. So really focus on yourself and what makes you happy and where you're going. And don't worry about the others because well, the way you're going to be successful and get to wherever you want to be is your self-selection and where you're going. So I use quotes a lot. Um, uh, knowing others is wisdom and knowing yourself is enlightenment. So really figure out who you are and what makes you tick. I have all the chairs reading a book called Drive by Daniel Pink, which is why you come to work every day. It seems pretty interesting. That it seems simple. As a resident, you don't have to read the book. You come because they tell you, right? You have to come. You have to show up. But as you get older, you need to figure out why do you come to work every day? What do you want to do? And I would highly recommend reading that book so you make that happen. And, and really focusing on what kind of patients you want to take care of, how do you want to do this, where you want to be, and that there's many things you can contribute through your career. And, and, and I'm a good example of that. You know, I, 
I think you can do many other things with your career as you go through it. You just have to decide what that is. So I appreciate you letting me give grand rounds, and I'll take any questions. Thanks. Any questions from the crowd? Bill. I'm going to do the easy stuff, the national stuff, not the hard stuff. I know. Stuff well, you, he, he was way ahead of the well. curve. He's yeah. been married to another surgeon since the day I met him. So and you, you, and you, that's a whole other story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not burned out yet. No, no, um, no, you're good. Should all aneurysm care be regionalized? So yeah. you talked about sending patients from rural hospitals yeah. to teaching centers. You didn't really talk too much about the outcomes, which I think most literature suggests patients actually do just fine, even if they have to travel long distance to the work you're in. Right. How about all aneurysm in care or complex surgical care? Should that be regionalized? Should there should you not be allowed to get treated if you live in Decatur or some other small town? Yeah. And I, I think we're actually coming to that. And and part of it I think is detection. I think the key for aneurysms is knowing you have one. Because if you look at the people that you see that either get in trouble when I was in Milwaukee, um, about 60% didn't even know they had an aneurysm. So detection is key. You know, there has been a Medicare law passed that if you have risk factors, you can get a screening ultrasound at age 60 to do that. So I think detection is key. And I do think you need to regionalize it. And I think the one it's way it's going to work is to do an endovascular aneurysm is now expensive. You have to have equipment. And similar to very complex um, GI procedures and things too, we need lots more equipment and smaller hospitals can't afford to have those anymore. And there has been a prediction that there's either going to be outposts, like 50 to 100 bed hospitals out there that can do appendectomies, INDs, simple things, coles, and that everything else should be shipped. The reason people haven't been able to do that is people over the age of 60, so I always take my age and add a year and call them old, so people over the age of 60 won't travel. Uh, when I was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, there's a river through Green Bay, the Green Bay River. People wouldn't even cross the river to get care. They stayed here. My mother uh, wouldn't even go down to um, Springfield, Illinois to get care, which was 42 miles away from Decatur, because the older generation doesn't travel. Young generation, many of you on Friday will go to Seattle for a wedding or you'll go to Mexico for you know, a long weekend. They travel all the time. So the new generation sees nothing wrong with traveling. And now if they have health care benefits that allow them to travel, then they will because the indigent patient can't travel because they're sort of in their city. But they could travel to the hospital in the city. That's good. And we do have a lot of evidence that if you go to a low volume hospital, and it's just in your neighborhood, you tend not to do as well as if you go a few miles to the high volume hospital. So I think we're going to get there, and I think we're going to do it by cost, we're going to do it by expertise, because many of those surgeons doing them maybe aren't vascular trained, but there's plenty, in the next 10 years, most everyone's going to be vascular trained that does vascular surgery. So I do think we should do that, and patients need to know. I think they can get online to do that. That being said, though, last week I saw a patient for an effort thrombosis, Obviously, I'm pretty good at that. She chose to go back to her healthcare system, which I won't speak out loud, because she's been there 15 years. You know, so who's going to do that rib resection over there? I need to ask you that. But um, but she chose that because of comfort, assuming they would do as well as I would do. So I think part of it is education of our patients too. And and you know, a lot of what people need surgically is pretty simple. You know, it's appendectomies, gallbladders, breast surgery. Not that that's simple, simple, but it's not high mortality. When you get into big thoracic aneurysms or parasophageal hernia whipples, there's no question that going to a place where the hospital system is ready for you is important. So I think the answer is yes. I think we got a ways to go and it's going to be driven by cost, but I think actually value will come right behind it. Yeah. One of your early slides implied that randomized trials were more linked to efficacy than effectiveness. Mm -hmm. um, however, that's not necessarily the case. Large, uh, quote unquote, Pragmatic trials really are uh, the apex study design to address effectiveness. Uh, should this be more of a priority for for surgeons? Yes. We, we tend, especially in this country, uh, in general, but also for surgeons, not to execute those, whether it's a matter of funding or being able to collaborate. Yeah, and that's a great question. So, uh, what he's asking is, you know, wh how are we going to go forward when we? Um, probably don't have the money. I didn't tell the, the, the over trial 
cost $21 million okay, to do it. So a great trial. Thank goodness we're publishing a lot. Um, and the Adam trial was about $12 million. So part of it is for follow-up and all that. So registry data and having prospective analysis of what we're doing is going to be the way we're going to do everything in the, in the future. And I think you're absolutely right. We're actually surgeons, if you aren't participating in a registry and participating uh, and putting your cases in so we can see outcomes. You really, one, you're going to need to for a CME and also probably to get paid, which is great. It's going to make us do it. And then also we'll be able to have large data sets that we actually can watch prospective changes. The reason I also think that's better is that technology is going to change, isn't it? We were lucky to shift the sands here with endovascular grafts, but some days you're going to have such an improvement on either anesthesia, technique or, or some sort of device that your trial is going to blow up because you actually can't, you have to let people have the newest and latest. And that I think is the benefit of a registry. Say you want to do something new or different, you actually watch it and see it. Ventral hernia is one that we're actually going to do the college with that. We're going to take ventral hernia repair, which is a very common, very expensive, highly a uh, fraudulent, sort of highly failed procedure. About a third of them don't get better after someone fixes it. So we're going to use um, a registry data looking at different components, not telling people what to do, but looking at what people do out there and, and monitoring recurrence rates, complications, and, making, and then letting people know what works and doesn't work. The other thing is a surgeon, you may not have a hundred in one year in order to assess it, but if you participate in these, you can see a whole dynamic of two or three hundred that may change the way you do it. And if you're a participant, I think you're much more likely to change practice than if you just read a retrospective study of someone else. You'll say, well, I can do that better than them. But I think you're absolutely right. I think the number of clinical trials we're going to see is going to go way down. We're trying to do one in carotid disease, looking at treatment of asymptomatic carotid, because we think perhaps you don't even need to operate on that. Uh, and, though, uh, and, and we could get that data from registries, but we think it actually might be a little cheaper. But in the future, I think you're absolutely right. All right, thanks. Have a great day.